second second try at this. Anders, what do you say? <laughs> Should we give this a go? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's knock it out. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, Ron from New Record Day, I have uh, a guest speaker today on the show. This is Anders from Hegel Amplification. This is the second time that we're doing this. We had some technical difficulties the first time around, and Anders being the great sport that he is, he's decided to do it again. And so um, the purpose of this video is just to learn a little bit more about Hegel. Uh, as a lot of you guys know, I got in the H390 in for review, and I thought this is a great opportunity to talk about Hegel, about this amplifier, and we're going to just learn a little bit about what makes their amplifiers unique uh, because they are pretty interesting and they do some things that, well, no other amplifiers are doing. And so, um, Anders, thank you so much for <laughs> a second try at this. I really do appreciate it, man. No, thank you for having me. Um, before we get started, the video is not sponsored. Uh, Hegel is not paying me money to do this. This was my idea and it is absolutely just for you guys. I know that uh, you guys might be interested in hearing a little bit more about Hegel amplification. So I do have some question, questions that we're going to run through real quickly and um, just see if we can knock this out. So Anders, the first question that I have for you is who are you and what do you do for Hegel? And then just kind of give us a, a brief idea as to how Hegel got up off the ground and how this all started. Sure. Well, my name is Anders Erdside, as you can probably see on the screen. And uh, my job for Hegel is the VP of sales and marketing. Uh, I'm also the, uh, what you call it, chief listener or something uh, during R&D. So, so uh, I am involved in most parts of the company. Uh, and I've been with Hegel for 12 years now. I started two days before Lehman Brothers fell in, in 2008. So that was a challenging time to start as a sales manager for a company. Uh, but Hegel has been around since in various forms and shapes since 1988. Uh, so it started out when our founder, Ben Tolter, who is still today 100% uh, owner of Hegel, he was studying for a um, master degree in, in um, microelectronics and he played in a rock band that still played today. It's called the Hegel band and they play Thin Lizzy cover songs. And uh, during his studying, uh, they frequently played on a live stage in, in Trondheim uh, in Norway uh, called Samfun. And uh, the amplifiers for the live stage broke. So uh, they couldn't afford to, to buy new ones. Uh, but Bent, uh, studying what he was studying, he, he offered to build some. And so he built uh, five amplifiers uh, for the live stage. He actually bought components and parts from another Norwegian uh, amplifier designer called Auditon, who existed mm -hmm. back then. They aren't really around that much more, uh, but they exist. Anyway, he built them and four of them still place today. And the fifth is in our museum. So that started it and that inspired him, you know, during the building and developing of these PA amplifiers, uh, it inspired him to work more on, on hi-fi. Mm. Mm. Um, with all of the ampli amplifiers that you guys have right now, one of the things that I would be curious to know is you know, is there a is there a Hegel house sound? Is there a sound that you guys are going for? Or could one say that, you know, one amplifier sounds different from the next amplifier? For us, I think there is a house sound, um, but it's not it's not like we sat down and we thought I, I like this warm and fussy sound or I like this bright and dynamic or I like this or that. It's um, the sound philosophy of Hegel is, is really to add as little as possible. And I suppose we'll talk a little bit later on about our, our patented technology that came out of this inspiration Bent got back in the late 80s. But in essence, it's, it's about the amplifier adding as little of itself as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, when sound passes through a piece of electronics, and I know it's 
the same with loudspeakers only same same but different but going through a piece of electronics the electronics will add byproducts of the music you're trying to reproduce uh, it will make small copies of the sound you're you're playing on different frequencies so you're hearing the sum of the music plus a lot of of other things and those other things are called distortion so our sound philosophy is basically to add as little distortion as possible so that's what or one of the things i'm doing is that what during r d when bent and the other designers has worked with their computers and measurement equipment um, for a certain time and you're you're starting to you know uh, to, to hit the wall where you don't really know what you're going to look for anymore then i get it on my desk and i start to listen to it and then mm. uh, i don't listen for a specific type of sound because you don't have to every time i get a hegel amplifier on my desk and hook it up it sounds like a hegel because mm. if it adds little distortion you know you're very close to the original sound there is no warm or bright but yeah. what i do then is i listen for errors mm. you're listening is there something off in the bass is there uh, something strange in the highs or in the mids or somewhere uh, where you think you're hearing components that weren't supposed to be there and then i send it back and i say to the engineers i think there is something there and there and there and uh, well, sometimes they will respond to me, um, yes, there is. I just didn't think it would be audible. Or they say, hmm, strange, uh, but let's go back and try to measure it from this angle or that angle. And, mm -hmm. and very often they find it. And sometimes I'm just being an idiot <laughs> and hearing ghosts because you cannot trust your ears fully. Right. You have to, right. you know, uh, but how sound? not really the house sound is adding as little as possible and that creates a certain sound in the amplifiers mm. uh, some people say they've become warmer <clears throat> over the years and they actually have but that's just because we've found ways to solve some distortion issues we had in the past so yeah so clearly measurements are a big part of you know, the process of R and D, but so is listening. Um, when you guys are voicing your amplifiers, like what, what is the actual approach and, you know, what have you learned about what you can measure and what have you learned about what you can hear, you know, through listening, like what have mm -hmm. been some of the things that you've experienced? Well, one thing we talked about a little bit last time on the first try <laughs> to do this was bass, because there are some things, there's there's a couple of things here. One is that, you know, as a core philosophy of Hegel, uh, we're saying that if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, because we think if you hear something, it, it would be quantifiable in some, mm -hmm. some form. Uh, but some things are very difficult, like like bass. We had a couple of issues actually uh, when we made our mid-tier amplifiers first, when we designed the H160, and later when we designed the H190. Where during R and D, uh, the engineers wanted to try and try and save some money. And in the first case, it was for the uh, H160, where we tried to save just a few cents on switching brand of capacitor in the local power supply for the little chip that controls the volume level okay um and i got it on desk and i didn't know what had happened but mm -hmm. it was just all the the base was gone it wasn't completely gone but like the foundation and the texture of the base was just gone mm. um and i sent it back and i told them what i said and it was actually not possible with a with with a uh, with uh, equipment and things we had to measure it oh, i'm wow. sure you can measure it we just don't know exactly how and you know why it's that difficult but base can be really difficult to, to measure and quantify in electronics but most other things are and we spend a fortune every year on uh, on measurement equipment we have the best money can buy uh, a lot of audio precision things and 
uh, sitting around. So, uh, so we, we do take it very seriously. But the approach is really going back and forth. So when you think you've measured, you know, yourself into a corner, you can't go any further, or you don't really know where to go. I get it on my desk, and I'm never told what they have measured so far. So you're going in blindfolded and you compare it to some things you know, uh, and then you give the feedback, what you hear, and then we go back and forth until we're happy. So it's not really voicing, it's it's uh, error detection. Yeah, yeah, that's that makes sense. Um, do you, Have you ever found yourself surprised by you know, situations like you were just explaining where, you know, we have, it sounded like it was a capacitor change. Is that mm. what it was? Is a capacitor yep. change? Yep. You know, when you heard whatever you heard as a potential error, a lack of base or a lack of foundation, did it surprise you to find out that it was just such a small change that needed to be made? Or do you actually find that that's, that happens quite often, that just a small cap might make all the difference in the world of what you're hearing. Yeah, I think it, it happens quite often. It surprised me very much in the beginning when I started working for Hegel. Um, because I, I came from retail. I've been in hi-fi retail since I was 13 year, years old. So good old child labor. But it's, um, you know, going from there and into manufacturing, I started learning things and learning things about how things behaved and one of the or some of the training in Hegel was was to be able to see the correlation between what I heard and mm. measurements and very often I've been quite surprised at how small details make a lot of difference yeah. so it sounds boring sometimes when you say uh, or people would ask you know what has changed in the analog stage of this amplifier compared to the other one is like uh, yeah no we changed three transistors and a capacitor <laughs> and it's very boring because you want to hear you know as a customer or as a reseller you want to hear that oh yes we completely changed the board everything yeah. is new it's so big uh but it's very often it isn't it's just small things you discover very often by chance subtleties <laughs> Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then you discover them by chance and then uh, you start, hmm, what if we, uh, you know, do this and this and this and start to elaborate and build on that mm. and you make big changes from something quite small. So in that... Sometimes that's a di digression. Sorry, I always digress. But one thing that uh, especially our owner likes to do is to try and trick me. Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> so sometimes he will even build he doesn't have time to so much any longer but he used to sometimes build me things that were uh, had big errors and he knew. He, he knew yes he, he once built me a DAC uh, with um, a DAC chip called ESS that everybody was raving about yeah uh, that DAC chip has you know some good capabilities and some that aren't so good and he built me a DAC around that and gave it to me and said, hey, listen to this, Anders. I think this is this can be our new thing. And I was playing and for two, three or two, three tracks, I was, oh, this sounds so beefy, so meaty. Yeah. And then I started to realize, hmm, there is something completely wrong here. <laughs> uh, and then I, <laughs> I sent it back and, and Bent goes, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is awesome. You know, it's, it blows my mind how, you know, in these examples where we have a company that does have all of the equipment that you would need to properly measure an amplifier, you build a prototype, you feel like it's great, you send it to Anders, you hear an error, and then when you made this change to this capacitor, it's not like you changed the value of the cap, it's literally the same value, it's a different cap, right? I mean, yeah, it's a different yeah. brand or mm. higher quality or whatever you want to call it. It blows my mind that, you know, I'm, I'm one of the reviewers out there that when it comes to speakers, I do measurements. And the more mm. that I do measurements, some, it's like, I realize how little I know <laughs> about measurements. Yeah. It's like, I can't understand how this is making a difference. And it's, it's, it blows my mind. So that's a great example of exactly that, that you know, yeah. um, 
capacitor measures the same, but it does indeed sound different. Wow. Yeah, that is so often the case. It's, uh, we, we also do uh, uh, a lot of uh, listening tests on, uh, on transformers because we use mm. big toroidal transformers. Mm -hmm. And every two, three years, we buy sample transformers with the same values and same design uh, that we've, we've made from three, four, five different factories. Mm. And we get them back and we measure the amplifiers with the different transformers inside them. And the ones that are within spec, we do listening tests and blind testing on them to select transformer factory. The differences are quite big. Mm. Mm. That's awesome. If somebody was to sit down and ask you, hey, you guys have your entry level amplifier, which I think is the H95. Yeah, that's correct. H95. What would that experience be like when compared to your flagship, the H590? What what would be the biggest change that somebody would experience going from an H95 to the big boy? I think I have to use a, a huge cliche. Uh, it's like peeling off layers uh, mm. between you and the music. It's it's very cheesy to say it, but it is what it is because I often, when I do demos about Hegel, uh, unless it's for something very specific, I very often pick a good pair of speakers uh, for the show or at the store. And I start with the smallest H95 and then we, we compare them and, you know, with the same track uh, between each amplifier, we go from the H95 to the H120 to the H190 to the H390 to the H590 uh, and compare them. And, and it's a very, it's, it's, uh, it's a straight line. You, there's a familiarity between all the different amplifiers. Uh, they do sound the same, only not quite the same. It's for every step. Uh, things just ring out more clearly. The bass has more texture. Uh, so it is like that cheesy thing. You're just lifting a curtain um, one after the other. So that is the that is the change. And sometimes I feel that people or even also me, you get sucked in because you know what is there, what is that next level. Interesting. Oh. Why is this guy called the Robin Hood or the Rebel? What was the reason you guys decided to call him that? Well, it was uh, the amplifier we designed or launched uh, right before that one was our 590 uh, reference amplifier, mm -hmm. uh, which is $11,000. Mm -hmm. And um, when we launched that for the first time, we got some criticism also from, from consumers saying that one thing I don't like about the 590 is that with, with you guys, if you've launched something, I could almost always go and buy it or save up the money and, and actually go and buy it. Uh, but $11,000, that's not money I can actually go and save up and spend. Um, so with 390, we call him Robin Hood because he steals from the rich and gives to the poor, which isn't, it's now it's $6,000. So it's not really giving to the poor. Let's, let's but, be real. Right. Yeah. Yes, sure. exactly. Sure. You know, um, but it, it takes a lot from, uh, the big 590. So the DA mm. converter, uh, is almost identical to the one mm. in the 590. Uh, the output transistors are the same. A lot of the implementation is the same. It's just some things that, you know, takes us that last inch in the 590 isn't there because the last, you know, every inch becomes more and more expensive. Uh, but it's a lot of the 590 for almost half the money. So what? it's a Robin Hood. That makes sense. So, um, Walk us through a little bit about, you know, the DAC and the implementation of a DAC inside of your integrated amplifiers. Is it a chip-based DAC? Is it R2R topology? Like, what are you guys doing? And tell us a little bit about that. It's a chip-based DAC. Uh, it's always been that. And, uh, and one of the reasons is that uh, that's the only way 
uh, you can you can get the uh, dynamic range. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, um, and and we care very much about that. We also care very much about the chips we use, uh, but most importantly is is the implementation. Hegel is one of the few companies who designs absolutely everything inside our DAX ground up. That includes the design and build of the clock mechanisms, for example. Mm -hmm. So our master clocks, depending on the amplifier, uh, because they're of, of different qualities and, 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 uh, and a specification, but all the time we've designed uh, the clocks ground up. One of our mm -hmm. specialties in our DAX is how the clock is directly connected to uh, the D to the DAC chip uh, and and very well linked to uh, to the input stage or the uh, the buffer circuit. So you okay. can pick the data out of the buffer circuit and send it to the DAC very very precisely. Um, to do a, a little bit of digression um, again. Uh, DA, DA converters is it's a calculator, right? Mm. Because uh, DAs or digital music, when you ship it uh, PCM, uh, that is just a number that is is packed in in something called a binary number system, ones and zeros. So what a DAC does is really, if you play a, a CD. Uh, resolution material, 16-bit 44.1, as we all know. What mm -hmm. the DAC does is it really takes the first uh, 16 ones and zeros and it summarizes them and it ends up with a number uh, explaining exactly how loud is the music right now. So let's say it's this loud. And then it takes the next 16, summarize them and find what is the sound level. The next uh, sample, so to speak. And then what's the next, what's the next, what's the next, what's the next? And then it builds that music curve. It builds the music as a calculator. I see. Uh, yeah. So that's what it is. And, and uh, digression within the digression, if you have 24 bits, you have more numbers, you can get a bigger figure. So there yeah. can be a bigger difference between nothing and something. Anyway. Um, uh, if or the DA converter, the one or one of the things it's it's that is necessary for it is to receive those ones and zeros in the rhythm that it is expecting Perfectly in time. Yeah, exactly. So if it doesn't, if it comes like one one zero zero one 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 zero zero one one, then it starts to make calculation errors, mm. uh, and the calculation error is like if it was supposed to be this loud right now it's suddenly this loud or this mm -hmm. loud. And you mm -hmm. experience that in the same way as you do um, distortion in amplifiers. It's ex mm -hmm. it, it extra sounds that can make a DAC uh, sound flat or very bright and hard, depending on, on what type of, of distortion it is. It's called jitter. Uh, so we design very precise clocks that can pick uh, the numbers or ones and zeros out of the buffer circuit and control the DAC so we know that it comes into the DAC at exactly the, the rhythm it's supposed to. So they're very precise, extremely low jitter levels I see. due to these clocks. I see, say that is the most important part of our DACs. The timing is what's critical. I see. Yep, I exactly. See. Walk us through what you guys um, have done with AirPlay. Um, these, for those that don't know, these amplifiers do have, um, kind of a unique take on airplay and that would be through the ethernet connection in the back of the amplifier. What makes your airplay different than any other, you know, just standard airplay out there? Well, the biggest difference is actually that most companies that have an airplay system inside us just bought something uh, that is, you know, off the shelf from some factory in China or wherever. Uh, very few has designed an airplay implementation that's done for audio. Uh, so back in uh, back in 2010, 11, 12, 13, we were talking a lot about, you know, how we wanted to to 
get people to use Hegel, really. Well, you know, how would you want to play music? One of the things we do is we, we don't look so much at other manufacturers and what they do and what kind of products and features they have. We just very often sit together and we discuss how would you want to play music? And mm. everybody knew, you know, throughout uh, those years that, yes, we, we want to just play it from our phone. Yeah, we, we don't want a music server. We don't want, you know, a CD player or a turntable, not really, not when you just want to play your music. We want to mm -hmm. play it from the phone. And in 2013, we had the first possibility to do that where we could offer something. And that was uh, when Apple launched the SDK for AirPlay. It was a 2,500 page PDF explaining how AirPlay should function and work in any thinkable situation. So um, we uh, gave uh, our software guys a credit card to spend on pizza and Coke, and they sat <laughs> for six months and uh, oh, wow. and they got something that was, you know, it's part of it was pre-made, like how you decode and receive and communicate mm -hmm. uh, on the on the basic level. It's it's done, but what they did was to make a system where you're able to grab that signal out at a very early stage before Apple's resampling and things messes the signal up. Uh, so we made an AirPlay that sounded really good. And we actually also wrote our own proprietary operating system for our amplifiers uh, to make it more responsive. So, uh, so for AirPlay and also for other things like smart homes. Mm. Uh, but Apple's AirPlay in the Hegel amplifier sounds really good because Apple don't get to mess with a with a signal. We take the signal out on a very early stage and we apply our own uh, uh, signal treatment, uh, so to I speak. See. Yeah, I see. And we've since done the same for for um, uh, Spotify. Uh, we've done the same for DLNA. We are about to do the same for Rune. Uh, where we treat the signal uh, very, very carefully once it enters is, our amplifiers. That is awesome. Um, moving a little bit from digital into analog, I know that um, I think your most recent product is a phono stage. And, it is. Yeah. And I was, I wanted to ask you, um, why are we doing a standalone phono stage? What are the benefits to having it as a standalone phono stage versus having it stuffed inside of one of these beasts here behind me? Well, uh, first of all, let's address uh, why. And I think there's a, there's a fantastic why, and I saw it today, this morning, because I went to our Norwegian version of Best Buy. It's called mm. Elshop. And uh, at Elshop, uh, you walk into the you know stereo and TV department, and they have all kinds of Bluetooth radios and speakers and things. Uh, no stereo systems, uh, not even a surround system, but they do have turntables. They had a full row of turntables, which is, <laughs> to me, you know, three four years ago that would be insane. But there is a general interest in turntables. Um, we have been asked uh, for years to make a phono stage, ideally to make uh, a phono stage built into our integrated amplifiers, because that's what you know most of us would want. I would want that. But the challenge of building a phono stage into an amplifier is that you need very good shielding, because again, we use big toroidal transformers. They radiate noise, uh, and it's a kind of noise that uh, phono stage is very sensitive to. So mm. it's we don't think it's a good idea to have a phono stage inside the amplifier. We could probably get away with it, but getting away with something is not really what we stand for. We we like to present products where we are absolutely comfortable and we're really proud of all areas of that amplifier. If we put a simple phono stage inside the amp, we wouldn't be. And mm. and I I I would it's not Hegel way to do that, even mm. if it, you know, perhaps is unwise. But making an, an external phono stage that gives you some possibilities. 
again, we were quite reluctant and have been reluctant for many years uh, until we finally, a uh, year and a half ago, said, okay, let's do it. It was the, fine, it was, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. And, uh, and Ben said that, uh, yeah, but it's, it's not going to be a problem because I basically designed one years ago. It's on the shelf. I can just take it down from the shelf and tweak it and we'll put it in a box. Uh, but then Bent, who is, there would be no Hegel without Bent. Bent is, is one of the greatest guys, I've, if not the greatest I have ever worked for. And one of the things I really enjoy about working for Bent is his insane curiosity. Mm. Uh, he'd say that, okay, we'll just make a phono stage. I can do that in, you know, two afternoons and it'll be done. <laughs> uh, but then he just get, Ooh, what if I do this? What if I yeah. do that? And then he gets sucked into the rabbit hole. And then it's, he was just gone for half a year. And he said, Anders, I haven't had this month much fun in 10, 15 years. It's been great. And then we ended wow. up with something that was quite far. Uh, from the original ID. So instead of making, you know, a four or $500 uh, standard operation amplifier based uh, phono stage, we ended up with trying to make a $3,000 phono stage for $1,500 using a discrete FET trans, you know, matched pairs of FET transistors in the first two gain stages and a very well separated power supply from the gain stages. And, and I think it's a phenomenal phono stage. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm so proud of that phono stage. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Are you are you a record guy? Do you listen to quite a few records yourself? No, no. I used to, yeah, I used to, but uh, because that was uh, when when I was thirteen, fourteen years old, I worked all all summer uh, and on the Saturdays in a, in a record store, and all the money I earned, I I never got paid. I just mm. spent it on turntables and amplifiers and, and things from the store <laughs> because we sold records and 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 hi-fi. Uh, so I, you know, I had my round sitting all winter tweaking on my Thorns. And at one point I had a Goldman turntable, which I was very proud of and setting them up and, and, and doing this. But after a while in 2009, when I started working for Hegel and not mm -hmm. on just with Hegel, uh, I decided that digital is where the fight is. You know, that mm. I have to learn this. I have mm. to understand and learn myself. How can I get my computer to sound as good as the best CD player we have? Yeah. And then, you know, that took you, you know, in a different direction. So am I a record guy? Not really, but I'm a music guy. I think that matters the most. How you play, it doesn't matter, but yeah. that you play it. Yeah, it's it's funny. A lot of the guys give me a hard time. Obviously, my channel is New Record Day, and you would think there's mm -hmm. a lot more talk about records. And at the point where I became a dad of one, it got a little more challenging to get into records. And then when we had twins after that, <laughs> playing a record is like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's a chore. That's a lot. You're asking a lot of me. <laughs> um, yeah. But nonetheless, I, I I agree with you in that both, you know, both do some really interesting things and both are fantastic formats in very different ways. And I don't think that you have to pick one or the other. I think both can be absolutely enjoyed and both offer, you know, exactly that, a lot of enjoyment. I agree. Um, I, you know, one of the things that has surprised me or... Uh, or not surprised, that's the wrong word, but what I've been enjoying is comparing a little bit of vinyl uh, with digital. And mm -hmm. my personal experience is that things that was, or music that was originally made for vinyl or made for analog sounds better on analog. Yes. Uh, and the other way around, because I, well, I, I tried buying some, LPs with you know new recordings and that mm -hmm. doesn't sound good at all on vinyl. Yeah, it just sounds a little bit out of place. Like, yeah. So yeah, 
That uh, that is something I talk about a lot on my channel because when you know we had this huge, you know, vinyl records revolution and resurgence into vinyl, um, I quickly wanted to, while educating myself, educate others. Like a lot of these records that you're paying money for, it's really not that great. I mean, it really isn't exactly. that great. You know, it's like either a bad pressing or it's really just digital that's just thrown onto a record and you know, to get the, you know, the most out of the, the dynamic range and things like that, you might as well just get the CD, you know, or, or listen to yeah. it digitally. Um, and that's been interesting, but at the same time, I completely agree with you that I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. And if mm -hmm. I want to listen to Pink Floyd, I'm going to put on the record. I'm not going to bother mm -hmm. with digital because it just sounds like the real deal to me, you know, like when I play exactly. the records. So exactly. Um, well, the last thing I want to talk to you about is I think one of the more interesting and unique things about your amplifiers, and I want people to know that I'm using the word unique properly, meaning that there is nothing out there that is quite like this. And that is the way that you guys are dealing with negative feedback in your amplifiers. This is really your bread and butter. It's what makes Hegel so interesting and so unique to a lot of people. So. Can you kind of explain what is that? Like what, what, what is negative feedback? Is it a bad or a good thing? And what are you guys doing to handle or deal with negative feedback in the amplifier? Well, feedback is, is normally a necessary thing. Uh, I don't think there are any amplifiers out there without any negative feedback uh, because without it, it would oscillate. Mm -hmm. um, but then there is feedback uh, or local feedback and global feedback. And there are amplifiers who don't use or use very little uh, global feedback in their amplifiers. But it's a, it's a correction. Uh, it's, a, it's a correction network, basically, to reduce distortion in amplifiers and make them stable. Um, and and um, th one of the problems with it is that you get you get time delays uh, so you get actually more distortion in in some forms with the use of feedback and um, it, the 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 reason why hegel came to be at all was bent's curiosity again because when going back to the first thing we talked about where does hegel come from we came from building five pa amplifiers for a loud stage in trondheim in norway and when ben built those you know, he built them, you know, just using a white paper on amplifier design. But he stumbled on this dilemma of using global feedback to get a stable amplifier, uh, or for that matter, local feedback. And he thought, is there a better way? Uh, is there a better way to make analog amplifiers? So he made his master thesis uh, about this. And uh, the, the Technical University in Trondheim in Norway has bought one of the first computers in the world that could sim simulate electronic circuits. So I think we were the first guys in the world who used computers to simulate the original white papers from Motorola and Toshiba on mm. you know how to make a solid state amplifier. And um, the, the master thesis ended up with an idea on how you could make it completely different. Uh, and it took a while uh, before he managed to turn that ID into something specific. So he worked a few years as a transistor and IC designer at Tannberg. Uh, and he worked to other places until he got um, an investor, a big telecom company that saw his ID and thought, this is great. We can turn this into a product or a license that we could license out to Sony, Harman, JBL, Monster Cable, and whoever was, was big in the 90s. So in the mid-90s, we were uh, seven engineers working full-time in Oslo, just turning this ID into an actual patented amplifier design that was called Sound Engine, and is still called Sound Engine. Uh, we've renewed it a couple of times because the first one was about this big and now it's about this big. Uh, but what it, what it is, it's basically an analog computer uh, that takes a sample of the signal that comes into the amplifier and it compares it to the signal that's 
going out of the amplifier. So if you take the signal that goes into the amp and the signal that goes out of the amplifier and put them on top of one another and switch the phase on one, mm. then you're left with a difference. So then you know if you play two signals at the same time but flip the phase on one, you're, what you're left with and what you can hear is just a difference. The same way as if you take two loudspeakers, put them face to face and switch plus and minus on the loudspeaker cables, the sound almost goes away. Mm. You're in theory left with, with just the differences between the left and right. Same frequencies being played cancel each other out. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So th what you're left with when you take or, or, or do that drill in an amplifier, um, compare the input with the output, what you're left with is all the sounds that is generated by the amplifier itself, meaning the distortion. And what we do, what this patented design does, is that we play that difference forward into the loudspeaker outputs in reverse phase. Mm. So just the difference is being played forward into the loudspeaker in reverse phase. So we dynamically cancel out distortion and it's super effective. So, wow. and not just that, because normally you tune um, amplifier distortion with bias. So you can, you can, uh, or one type of distortion, the most dramatic crossover distortion. You tune it by adjusting the bias in the amplifier and the screw. So you're adjusting the, uh, the constant power uh, or current on the output stages. And then you can get pretty good numbers. So you can, you can write in your technical paper, it's THD 0.0007%. Uh, but that is measured with a steady uh, amplitude, steady frequency, and steady load. Well, music is dynamic in all you know frequency, amplitude, uh, and load. So our system is is dynamic, like music. While the yeah. normal uh, way to to reduce distortion in the amplifier is based on steady state, so it will work really well at one kilohertz, eight ohms uh, signal, for example but it doesn't work when you play music. So it's it's very good. And a big portion of the Hegel sound is uh, due to that sound engine. And there's another side effect to it is that we can allow very low output impedance of the amplifier. And that gives us very high damping factor and mm. high damping factor gives you bass and dynamics. Control, yeah. Exactly. You get a very, mm. very stable amplifier. So nobody else in the world has anything like the sound engine. You know, uh, I think a good place to end this is when I announced that I was getting this guy in, it was interesting to see all the comments come in through Instagram and Facebook and YouTube community. And what you just said is what a lot of folks were saying is, oh, those things are so powerful and dynamic and the bass is crazy good. And what I thought was interesting is we had that camp saying those things about your amplifier. And then at the same time, equally, we had another camp saying, those are so engaging and they are not, you know, bright or forward or edgy. It's just such a musical and beautiful sounding amplifier. And as a reviewer, when, whenever I see comments like that, my brain automatically starts to think like, well, which one is right? Like, is it that or is it that? Which which of you guys are really paying attention? And without giving too much away, I got to say, if you guys indeed found a way to marry both of those, dynamic, powerful, you know, confident in bass, and yet at the same time is refined and engaging, then I would say you've you've succeeded in a remarkable amplification design. I mean, there's no doubt about that because that's the kind of amplifier that I would want to sit down and listen to. Yeah. So I'm excited. Uh, Anders, cool. thank you. Thank you, well, man. Thank you. I, I've really appreciated this, guys. Um, look forward to my review of the H390. Um, I'm probably going to take my time with it. I'll probably have it ready in a few years so I can spend as much time as I can, <laughs> I can with Amplifier. Um, 
no, seriously, I've had a blast with it so far. And um, like all my reviews, I will tell you exactly what I think about it. Everything will be 